Dan is het nu tijd om de dag te beginnen met onze eerste spreker. Hij is een van de invloedrijkste, hij staat in de top 100 van de meest invloedrijke Europese denkers en presentatoren. En hij heeft als specialisme technologie en humaniteit. En we hebben hem eigenlijk gevraagd van Gert, hoe zie jij de toekomst hè? met alles wat er gebeurt op het gebied van technologie? Hoe zie jij de toekomst van eten en drinken? voor je, en hij is niet het expert op het gebied van eten en drinken, maar wel van technologie, en hoe zie jij de rol van ons mensen? He, hoe gaat dat veranderen? En wat moeten we doen met z'n allen? Daarom een warm applaus voor Gert Leonard. Oh, what a nice talk. Guten Morgen. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to speak in English. If you have trouble with that, use the headsets. <laughs> um, I lived in America for 17 years. And in the US, if you speak slowly on stage, people leave. Because you know, they want you to go stuff quickly. So I'm a futurist. I've been doing this roughly for 20 years. Uh, just to explain shortly what that means, I don't predict the future. I observe the future. Basically, I look at the next five to seven years and try to figure out how we can incorporate what we see in the future into today. And the topic today is really a dear topic to me, the topic of food and a healthy future. I'm a hobby cook. I love to cook every day when I'm at home, if I'm at home. I travel too much for that. But I have a strong connection to food. So I want to get started with this and dive right in. The first one is a really important slide. The last three years... Uh, everywhere I speak, I get feedback from people saying that the future is probably going to be bad. Yeah. It's really interesting, it varies largely by country, like in Holland, not as bad, for example, also not in Switzerland, but Germany, US. Right? People saying, well, the future will be bad because first, climate change, not the Americans, but us, right? Say so climate change is bad. The machines are coming, right? the robots are coming, AI is coming, and they will take our work first, and then they will kill us. Right? <laughs> so 2050, game over. Right? And exponential change. You know, this is the key American <laughs> phrase yeah, that you hear everywhere. Every, everything has to be exponential, but of course the most important thing is exponential profit, right? Uh, not just exponential gain. So lots of people are worried about the future. But as Hans already said, yeah, I think the future is better than we think. If you look at the facts, decline of poverty, just quick here, life expectancy increasing, global child mortality decreasing, declining cost of solar panels, solving energy, declining cost of batteries, long list, long list, long list. Yeah. What we hear in media is that we're probably going to do really bad in the future, but if we look at the present, we can already say, well, it's actually getting a lot better. The only problem, of course, is that these problems are not necessarily of technical nature. You know, te technology solves certain kinds of problems, but not others. What has happened in the last 10 years with the internet? We've solved many problems, like free phone calls, great music, you know, 10 euros for 21 million songs. That's all been great. But we haven't solved social problems. Inequality, right? the, the difference in income, right? and you know, divine, the dividing line between the have and have-nots. I mean, clearly that's going to be something that we have to solve differently. We're moving into fully digital future where it's basically going to be as normal as breathing is to be connected. In 10 years, we're going to have 30, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, estimated uh, 10 billion people on the internet, we're going to have roughly 80% at very high speed, uh, 5G and others. So we're going to have roughly 9 billion people at fast speed connected all the time. Today, it's 3.6. And that makes a huge difference. I imagine you know, all those things that we have today that's going to be available globally. Um, so in my book, which I'll show you later, called Technology Versus Humanity, this is the key chapter number three. Uh, you can download for free at megashifts.digital in 10 languages. But it's about this whole change of what's happening, uh, which I used to call the Asians, because they, you know, they all end with Asian. <laughs> but basically, it's not just digitization is virtualization, you know, having things that are in virtual spaces. Uh, disintermediation, 
like what Amazon has done to, to e-commerce. Right? Mobilization, cognification, right? which is basically things becoming smart. Think about where that's going to go in the next 10 years. Right? But computers will become so smart that we don't even know that they're going to be there. Right? That we're just going to speak to a wall and they're going to give us answers. Right? Language translation, driving cars, flying airplanes, automating work. And many of those things will be amazing. Because they're going to take, you know, basically things that we don't really want to do and they're going to automate them. Like, you know, now if you go to the airport at night, like in Zurich, closes at 12, it's not the people that come out to clear the airport, it's the bots. Right? And it's the bots that take your luggage. So it's the changes that we're going to see are going to be mind blocking here, and that's something you should take a good look at impacting food. I'll talk more about that in detail shortly, but uh, here's a short video on this. This one where the, the robot comes and does the cleaning or does the cooking. I find this rather strange, you know. Uh, why? But okay. So uh, this is what's happening. I mean, it could be heaven or it could be hell. Many of those things will say, okay, that's really great. The refrigerator can tell the grocery store that I'm out of milk. That's amazing, you know, if you're, if you're lazy, that's good. Right? But maybe it's also a little bit... Maybe the, the refrigerator could also lock the door if I'm on a diet. Right? Uh, in, in fact, there is a, uh, a refrigerator from Samsung that does exactly this. Right? And it monitors, monitors your toilet, too. Right? I'm not going to go into details here, but this is basically a two-way monitor, you could say. Right? So we're moving into a future where everything around us is becoming smart. Everything is connected, everything is being read, the Internet of Things, right? so you just have the transformer, we call it jokingly, and you stick the old business in and out comes the new one, right? Smart city, smart home, smart retail, smart transport, smart food, smart agriculture, maybe even smart government. Right. So that's what technology does. You know, paperless office, using apps, you know, everything online, that's a good thing, right? That only works really because we have in the end, you know, this in the background. Right? We have a machine that learns patterns, that understands things. Some call it artificial intelligence. Yeah? I would propose that we forget the word because this is neither artificial. I mean, all computers are artificial, right? And it's also not intelligent. Right? Not like us. I mean, we're, we're intelligent in a pretty amazing way. But we can't compete with computers on data input. Yeah. I mean, a computer can look at a real-time social media input of 100 trillion feeds and, and, and find a pattern. Right? We can't do that. But then, can it find a pattern that's not a pattern? Right. Can it understand your message that you're not actually saying? So when you have a conversation with humans, you know, most of the stuff that we transport is actually not said. It's between the lines. We communicate like this, you know, not just in a binary way, like yes, no, yes, no. We also don't live this way like computers do in a, in a binary way. You know? It's either a zero or it's a one. You must don't do that. We say, oh, maybe, you know, change our mind, maybe we lie, maybe we cheat, you know, maybe, maybe it's a 0 0.4 now and 0 0.8 tomorrow, and, you know, this is how we work. It's called multinary. So in a world like this where everything is smart, I think it's fantastic because, yeah, it's efficient. I mean, with food and agriculture, yeah, that's, 
clearly going to be one of the big solutions. Okay. But I think when we think about things like this, the robots are coming everywhere. Right? We say that's also quite good because yeah, we used to have 90% of people work in farming uh, around the world. Now it's 2.1 or something like that. Right? Because we use machines. But on the other hand, I would say, riffing off Einstein, everything should be as smart as necessary, but not smarter. In other words, there's a couple of things where I'm, th I'm saying, well, maybe this is a little bit too smart to be human, right, to fit with us. Yeah. Do we have to put sort of a restrainer on it? Yeah. Like, we want artificial intelligence to do, you know, the, all the donkey work for us, you know, the, the paperwork and the routine, and, uh, but we, we don't want the AI to decide if somebody's going to stay in jail, right? Or if we're going to have children or not. Values, ethics. Yeah. Those are important questions. Technology will not solve our political problems just because we have an AI. Right? Technology will just say, well, so what? These people die. You know, it's efficient. Right? Yeah. That's not quite how we operate. <laughs> so this is really important for us to keep in mind. Let's talk about <coughs> food. I'll talk more about meat in a, in a second. 28% right? of the global uh, pollution, CO2, is caused by agriculture. Most of that by meat. This meat. Not chickens so much, and others, but mostly beef. And now we're living in a world where we're connecting all of the beef. You know, in Switzerland, we, had, we now have uh, uh, radio frequency ID chips around the cows. Costs about 100,000 per, per barn. And then the cows can go and milk themselves, you know, because the, the milking machine comes automatically and, and finds the target. So now we're connecting everything, but I think it's really quite interesting to see that uh, as far as the future is concerned, it's actually happening in such a way where we say the future really is not an extension of the present. I mean, if you look at everything around us, the future is unlikely to be at all like the present. <laughs> the music business, where I worked for a long time, used to be about plastic, distribution. Now it's in the cloud. Right? Music is basically free. Yeah, it's 10 euros for 20 million songs, which is basically free. Car companies today are saying, well, the future of the car is not to have a car. Okay. To share the car, to have a subscription to a car, the Spotify for cars is coming, you may have heard. Okay. Apple is rumored to announce a subscription to Apple products. So you don't own it anymore, you just take whatever you want. Okay. And food? The future can't be like it is today. Right? 300 million tons of E40 whatever in our food. Right? Huge water problems, agricultural problems, CO2 problems. So what I'm hoping for is this convergence of biology, technology, food, and agriculture. You could safely say that biology and technology are converging. The next 10 years will really accelerate this. In 20 years, we'll be at the point to where we can actually program animals and humans. Program in the sense of saying like I, that, that genome should not be active, not in the sense of reprogramming, right? Uh, CRISPR-Cas9, you heard about the operations and of course GMOs. Do we want that? Is that actually good? This is a very big discussion, of course, especially when it's about humans. But this convergence, is going to be very, very positive for us in a larger sense, for example, in energy. Technology can solve all of those problems piece by piece, but then we have to apply some sort of governance to it. I mean, if you're looking at these stats here, consider yourself lucky, you're living in the biggest time of technological transformation in human history. Because all this stuff, I mean, you know, solar energy and, and battery-driven cars existed 50 years ago. AI was tried 30 years ago. But it's actually working today. I mean, look at the boom of things that's coming, energy storage, all of those things. Right? The next 20 years will bring more change than the previous 300 years. And many uh, people that I speak to are saying, well, you know, you lived in California too long uh, with the superlatives and all those kind of things. Right? And I'm saying, yeah, 300 years ago, Industrial Revolution, maybe World War II, the atomic bomb, 
But what's going to happen in the next 20 years is that this, you know, what you use today, right, this is the extension of our brain, you know, our second brain. Yeah. This will move here, and then here, and then here. Okay. We're going to be able to change ourselves. I don't think that's a really good idea to change ourselves in such a way, right? but it's possible. Elon Musk is saying that we should connect our brain to the internet directly, using a bunch of tiny holes in your head. I'm wondering if he's going to be the first to try this, you know. So he says we have to compete with AI and therefore our brain has to connect to the internet directly. Become a machine, essentially. So in this future, you know, the kids of your kids will live to be an average of 100 years old. They will never know how to drive a car because they can just speak to it. They will definitely not know gas engines. That's us, you know, we love gas engines, they make the sound and everything. That's the huge shift coming. What does it mean for food, for agriculture, for health? I mean, the sky is the limit, 20 years, that's, that's a long time. And let me show you the, what I call the game changes, okay? The game changes are nine things, you can also find them in my book. There are nine things in here that we need to know. Data, the cloud, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the blockchain, 3D printing, virtual reality, and genome editing. I know it's enough to make your head spin, right? Just like, oh my god, you know, do I have to know about all these things? So here's a, a list for you to pin on your wall. This is the result of the game changes. Right? Data, connected everything, cloud everything, anything can be computed. Now the idea of neuromorphic computing, you know, 3D computing, is already here. The next step is quantum computing, which means computers that have an average power a million times of my box that's sitting on the table over there. So you can imagine in 10 years, you will have unlimited computing power available at your fingertips in the cloud. Unlimited, I'm talking about seriously unlimited. Right? I mean, today, if you use a, a device to scan your DNA, it takes a week, costs 1,000 euros. In 10 years, I do it on here while I'm having a date, if I were to date. Right? Takes four seconds and it's free. So I can compare my DNA with yours to see if we're going to, you know, go on on the date <laughs> or not. And do other things, you know, who knows what happens there. But, so this is the advance of technology. I mean, all of those things are happening at the same time, so consider yourself lucky because it's, it's it's, it's very empowering, but it's also very scary. So we have to think about how do we react. In a world where food currently is not really connected, this is what's going to happen. Everything that we know in technology is going to impact what we do with food and distribution, how we eat, where we eat, what we eat, why we eat. There's only one thing about food, of course, that's really interesting. Food is human. Robots don't eat. They don't have to eat. This is one inefficiency that we have, humans. You know, we have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to you know, do all those things. We're not machines. And that's why I think food is so important. When we think in this context, you know, this is definitely going to happen, already is happening, the idea of reprogramming food, animals, and humans. Because there's a big question about how we're going to supply the food. And I have a big question mark, but I haven't really decided. It's kind of like nuclear energy. You, know? <laughs> you can say, yeah, you know, it's Chernobyl, right? not so good. But then we think about the future of having coal, oil, and gas. Wouldn't we rather have nuclear fusion or solar energy? Right? Big discussion. So you know, we have these things like Chris Bacasnain is going to revolutionize how we can actually deal with things. We're going to be able to program things. Many questions that show up about ethics, like, you know, we have these trends, it's quite clear to us, is, you know, we're going to have to feed a lot more people, but at the same time, we have climate change issues and we're going to have less food. How do we solve this? So that's something we have to think about, okay, meat. I call this the great meat challenge. And this is where it gets personal. I'm not much of a meat eater. I prefer not to eat meat all the time, especially not when I'm traveling. But that happens generally when you get older, you know, I probably eat less meat than before. But 
But here's a big question. Now, the, the, the farmers were protesting here in Holland a couple of days ago right, about what's going to happen with the CO2 provision and, and the nitrate and all these things. And now the question really is, can we find a future of meat where meat does not equal animals? I think it's coming. I tasted the other day the Impossible Burger. Okay. It's 2,000 euros a pound, so it was an expensive meal. No. I didn't pay for it, though. It tasted good, just like a regular hamburger, which you know you could say tastes good or not, but because it's actual meat from the lab. They call it from lab to fork. Okay. Without cruelty. Clean meat. There's a company called Clean Meat. Right? that does this. Right now it's seriously expensive, but you can say, yeah, with the, you know, with the advent of technology, I mean, think about this years ago, you would, if you were roaming from Holland to Germany, you'd pay like two euros a megabyte of, of internet access, right? And what is it today? Like two gigs included. <laughs> so think about that for food. Bill Gates and Richard Branson, who are investors in this, they're saying, well, basically in 10 years, it'll be one-tenth of regular meat. So imagine a city not necessarily in Europe, but let's say in the Middle East, yeah. that, that has a very dry, in a dry area. You can have one house with a, a, a meat factory, a lab, right, that churns out the meat, and another house, a high-rise for vertical farming. 100,000 people fed. And organic. Right. No water pollution, no air pollution. Yeah. That's a gigantic business when you think about this. So look at this chart, right? Global meat consumption. I mean, of course, you said this is wildly optimistic, you know, that people would actually adopt cultured meat like this. Uh, so, in many ways, when we think about the future, we have to question our assumptions. I always say jokingly, if you're not worried, then you're not thinking about the future enough. And if you're not confused, you're not thinking about the future enough. Because, yeah, these things are all happening at the same time. We really have to think. This is what Richard Branson says about this, right? We will no longer need to kill any animals, and all that meat will be either clean or plant-based. Well, it's not going to be either or. Of course, we know this. But, I mean, you, you can see what's happening. This is a two-year-old video clip from the World Economic Forum <laughs> about this. And, yeah. You know, we used to doubt if we can have a self-driving car. We used to doubt that a car battery lasts longer than 50 kilometers. And now the next Tesla will go 500 kilometers. In three years, we're going to have a 10,000 euro car that goes 2,000 kilometers on one filling of electricity. At that point, we won't even have a car because we can just hop into one. So it's going to really change our future in so many ways. So here's the farmers again to bring up a key point. Technology can do all these things, but we have to keep up. We have to change the way that we're doing things. We have to change our habits. Talk about my own habit, flying. I fly to 100 gigs a year, and I go to Beijing for one day. I'm offsetting the carbon, but yeah. What if, and I think this is quite likely, in the near future, you will pay as much for carbon offsetting than you pay for the airplane ticket. Okay. That's coming. Maybe not quite in that dramatic proportion. Right now, it's like 50 cents, you know, to go from Amsterdam to Zurich. <laughs> but clearly, we're going to have to change our habits. Farmers are saying they'll quit, which is not good. So lots and lots of political and social issues. And we may see mandatory veganism. In other words, just like you can't drive a car in a city anymore, like a London, and very soon it'll be forbidden to drive your regular car in a city. Are we going to be forced to say, well, if you want to eat meat, it'll be really expensive. <laughs> Go to New Zealand, where a pack of cigarettes is $65. Okay. And they want to bring it to 100 People are still smoking. <laughs> But yeah, you think about that. If you smoke a pack a day, that's kind of expensive. <laughs> so yeah, that, I, I think we're going to see those things in a much different way. And the, on the flip side of this, technology allows us abundance. Think about the word abundance, you know, überfluss in German, maybe Dutch also, I think, right? 
where you have so many things that you stop worrying about availability. We have abundant music, we have abundant films, we have abundant books, we have very soon abundant transportation, you know. then we have abundant energy, will we have abundant food using technology? Like take water on the other side. Yeah? Water desalination is really expensive today, but the progress in water desalination is gigantic. We can expect in 10 years, we can have not abundance, that would be a little bit too hopeful, yeah? But we'll have solved the water problem through desalination. So here's a, uh, a clip from the past, okay, a scene from Star Trek that shows true abundance. I wonder what else is on the menu. One pan-fried catfish. Smells like the real thing. So the machine that prints your dinner, I, that is science fiction. Right? But a machine prints ice cream today. It prints a pizza. It prints houses. It prints hearts. So parts of what we need will be printed. In the future, our shoes can be printed in the store. Also too expensive today, but 10 years, yeah. I mean, there's consumer goods companies that are looking at printing ice cream on demand, on the beach. Yeah? So you go to the beach and say, I want my ice cream to be the following mix, and put your name on it, it prints it in real time. Yeah? Well, that's because there's mostly only chemicals in it. I guess it makes it easy. Yeah? So machines, technology, is bringing abundance. It's hard to believe today because we're, we're sitting here saying, well, a lot of people are still starving, they don't have water, they may not have toilets and all of these things, right? A post-meat, post-oil world. Okay? I think it's technically feasible, but it requires a lot of governance. Like, what do people do that used to work there? Okay? And will we have new jobs? On that note, I wouldn't be so pessimistic. Think about the past. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have much social media. Right? Today, social media is media. Right? 21 million people work in social media. Those jobs didn't exist 10 years ago. What jobs are we going to see because of this that don't exist today? Will there be enough jobs for everybody? Probably not. Different discussion. I'll get back to that in a second. But we're moving towards a new economic logic. Quite clearly, if we're looking at the world economic risk chart, right, this is in terms of impact on the left, nuclear war, of course, but on the right, this is our new normal. Right? And I, Hans was, I mentioned this earlier, we need to become, become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right? That's the new normal. Right? This is basically going to be like this and 10x, 100x. The future has extreme weather, climate change, natural disasters, data fraud, Two big things, right? Two sort of natural emergencies. One is climate change, and the other one is human change. And so that's something we have to think about, you know, which way we're going with this, because we can see on those charts clearly that GDP is, is, is growing, right? So in, in generally speaking, we're making more money. But all the negative effects are also growing, right? Temperature, sea level, energy use. Energy we can solve, because right? we'll have the tech to create enough energy for lower prices. The other things, yeah, that is going to be some heavy lifting. And I think basically we can safely say today, you know, if you listen to Greta speak, business as usual is dead. In the next couple of years, all companies in the field of food and health and everything around it will live up to a new standard. Is it sustainable? Is it circular? Is it good for people? Does it make money? You know, that's one of the concerns. And Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and all these companies are now thinking about this. You know, how can we make customized food and personalized food? What is the new business when the business of selling sort of you know, huge mass markets is finished? Two considerations. Right? Climate change in the next 20 years, we're just going to have to put up with it and adapt. That's going to cost trillions just to address this. But then again, it's probably a 
a big growth in jobs on that side of the equation. In 20 years, we can probably go back and fix it. CO2, taking CO2 out. Then the other thing is also kind of a pollution, right? Digital pollution. Human change. Facebook, the biggest digital polluter you can imagine, polluting our minds. I left Facebook last year because of that reason. I stopped speaking at Facebook events. Because this, this is a real problem, right? We are now going into a world where we have the, the one pollution is, is CO2, the other pollution is data. <laughs> that's something we have to think about when we think about human change and where that's going. Back to the climate change component here. Looking at this graph, it's quite clear. This is uh, United Nations Climate Change Panel information. The southern hemisphere is in real trouble when the temperature rises. And it is. So here's the shocking number. Between 150 and 300 million climate refugees by 2050. Talking about immigration problems, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a couple hundred thousand, a couple of million people. We're talking about almost 300 million uh, if the temperature goes up four degrees. Basically, you can't live there anymore. Right? Shocking number, but then again, we're going to see dramatic adaptation measures. <laughs> and this discussion is just now starting. We're going to see measures that says, okay, no more cruise ships, right? CO2 on airplanes, no cars in cities, mandatory charge to eat meat, Unimaginable today, because, yeah, it's not free capitalism, right? It's not. But what choice do we have? That's going to turbocharge information. We're moving to a new logic. I call this sustainable capitalism. This is not socialism, by the way, just in case you're thinking in this direction. Right? This is an idea of saying we have four principles, people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. There was a book that was called The Triple Bottom Line, which is very similar. You should read. Now, for the first time ever, there was a CEO roundtable a couple of weeks ago in the US where the CEOs of major companies have announced that in the future, it will no longer be just about shareholder value. Of course, it may be whitewashing or greenwashing, if you want. Right? <laughs> yeah, it could be. Robert F. Kennedy said this in 1968. GDP, GNP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. It is utterly useless for us to think about growth and profit and money when we have no place to enjoy. And this is dawning on people now, this, this idea of saying, okay, where are we going with this? And again, what I would say about this, you know, this is a new trend that we're going to see. We're going to see a new stock market. This would be a great idea for Holland. Let's create a stock market only for companies that adhere to the four bottom lines. Like we have NASDAQ for tech, let's have the quadruple P DAC right? index for companies who are on that agenda. So I can invest. Right? I think that's going to be a good idea. Let me talk about the future of work and then uh, we're going to have some questions later also with Hans. Okay? Really what's happening is that, yeah, this is the number one topic. Intelligent machines. Again, forget about the word AI. The fact that machines can learn and become smart and are no longer stupid. I mean, I can use this very soon. There's a rumor that you can, uh, you can use WhatsApp and you can have a real-time translation on whatever you've spoken into it. So you speak a little message to whoever, like we all do, right? but then you can say, convert to Chinese. Is that going to be taking the translators out of business? You know, where are they? Over there? Right? Not really, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a gradual thing. AI is going to be everywhere taking care of our routines. It's the end of routine for us. Whatever routine you are doing, if it doesn't require human input or compassion, <laughs> machines will learn it. So accounting, bookkeeping, uh, auditing, driving, checking out the supermarket call centers, 21 million people. Do you get compassion in a call center? I don't know, maybe at KLM do you do, I don't know. But you know, generally speaking, it's not required. I just solved the problem. <laughs> so we're going to see rapid automation. You see the first one here? Food preparation. 
And of course, that goes for food preparation like, like fast food, right? Not, not for, you know, restaurants of that nature. It's interesting to see McDonald's and Burger King are both looking at fully automating the burger places. So the food can be even better than today. I'm no, just kidding. Uh, but there's one person running the whole thing. Let's just automate the whole thing. On the flip side, now we can clearly see, okay, there's going to be damage by AI in automation, which is down here, right? You're looking at these jobs here, construction, manufacturing, transportation, storage, yeah, jobs declining. I mean, in the construction business, can you print a house? Yeah, you can print a house already. They're doing it in Chinese. A company called Weisun prints the whole house and prints the furniture and the people, not the people, not the people. Right. Prints everything. Right. On the flip side of this whole thing, take a look at the top of the pyramid, right, where we're looking at situations like healthcare. We talked about that yesterday. Scientific, communications, hospitality. For some reason, food is missing here. Right. Any uh, hospitality, I guess, is food, right? So, Growing, right? Anything that requires human ingenuity, creativity, design, negotiation, conversation, empathy, compassion is growing. That's our future job. That's why the food business is going to be a great business. We're not going to automate eating because we can eat paste like an astronaut, right? I mean, this is a human thing that we do. Our ultimate jobs is to be human to not be a robot. Ten years ago, we were looking at this and say, oh, I'm, you know, humans have to function well and be productive and you know, be efficient and all these things. So we were working like robots ten years ago, basically, including myself. You go to business school, you learn how to be a robot. Many of our kids at school today are learning how to download information and act like a robot. Case study, from A to B, if this, then that, right, like a computer. The future is going to be about being malleable, right? understanding things in a different place, inventing stuff, inventing your own job. Some people are saying roughly 70% uh, of new jobs haven't even been invented yet. That's our kids we're talking about here. They have to invent their own job. Look at the scale map of tomorrow. Also a bit of confusing because there's so many of them, but here, let me zoom in a little bit on this. Yeah. So move on the top quadrant here. This is the top right that was on the right before this. And you can basically see what's happening. There's two things that are going to guarantee our work in the future. That's human-only skills and technology. Look at this thing here, right? Technology design, project management, critical thinking, advanced IT, right next to each other. You want your kids to have work in the future? That's it. Right? I mean, we have to understand technology. If you don't understand technology, you're, you're toast, right? I mean, that's... But Technology as such will not be your ticket because computers are learning to program themselves. It's about understanding people. That's why you're here. Right? You're not downloading information. I hope you're also discussing it. So let me wrap up with the discussion of digital ethics. This is the key topic for 2019. Technology has become so powerful, again, a quadrant here, that shows you the most powerful things are also the most potentially harmful. That is genome editing, especially for humans, right? and artificial intelligence. We can use AI as a weapon of war. In fact, many countries are very excited about this. Right? Using automated drones to kill people. Right? That should be banned, but sort of, you know, obviously a difficult discussion. Right? Zooming in on this, I would say, well, basically, I think the most promising future is one where we don't stop doing things because we're worried but we also don't dismiss the risk. Like if we build the Internet of Things, if we build a, a new data economy, then we also have to put up with the consequences. If Facebook wants to be in social media, then they shouldn't be acting asocial. In my view, they have more from being good for us to being the worst poison you can imagine. They want to change and they have to change, they have to be responsible. It can't be somebody else's business to mop up after companies that take advantage of the digital economy. So it has to be included in the business model, you know, be holistic. And there's a real danger, you know, this is a, a scene that was making the rounds on the internet a couple of weeks ago, is a guy in a Tesla who's sleeping. Uh, it may have been fake, but it was definitely interesting. And, you know, this is kind of our 
attitude with technology, right? We're sleepwalking into technology. I mean, more people have relationship with their screens than they have with other people. We don't go anywhere without this because this is our mission control. So I have some new rules. I don't take the mobile phone in the bedroom anymore. If I can, I go out for dinner without the phone. We call it go naked because it's not covered. We really have to think about this. Let's not go blindly into a future that says whatever can be done should be done. That's a very bad idea. Because in 10 years, we can do anything. You want to replace your legs with a prosthesis so you can better do better mountain climbing? You can. You can do that today. And there are people wanting to do that today. Right? Can you marry a robot? People want to do that today. Right? Now, don't laugh. I mean, this is a big story. So we have to think about this. You know, what is the new normal? How far do we go? So final thoughts on this. Six future principles as part of my upcoming book. The first ones everybody knows. Exponential growth, converging industries, technology, biology, combinatorial skills, new things that become possible because of science. That's progress. And that progress is going to be so mind-boggling the next 10 years, if you don't observe it, you'll be perpetually late. But here's the other part of this. In the near future, when we think about food, healthcare, well-being, we've got to think beyond the exponential. You know, keep in mind that humans aren't exponential. You know, we are, we are linear, we're organic. We're not going to compete with machines as much as you want. We're not, right? Right now, we're kind of as smart as machines or vice versa. In 10 years, a machine with an IQ of 1 million. How do we compete? Well, we're going to be humans. The, the machines will never be human like we are. So we have to think about this. We have to think about holistic business models. And every company we do business with will be required to fill the agenda, right? Holistic, the circular economy, sustainability, not just on energy, but everything else. Human benefit. Going back to Facebook for a second. Facebook has been the most profitable company in the history of digital companies on the Internet. If you had invested in Facebook four years ago when they went public, you would have made the most money. Every time Facebook gets into a problem with privacy, which was 28 times last year, right, the stock goes up. When they, it was announced that they're going to pay 5 billion euros to the European Commission for privacy violation, the same day the stock went up 8%. As long as we have a mindset that says it doesn't matter what comes out the other end, as long as we have jobs and employment and more money, we're fine, right? That will not work. If we continue down that road, we're toast. Because these things make a lot of money. I mean, the oil industry made lots of money. We had to regulate it. So we're going to see all these things in the future coming together in sort of a joint new agenda that I call sustainable capitalism. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. And we can discuss a little bit with Hans later. Thanks very much for listening. I have a couple of free books with me. If you see me later, you can grab one. Thanks very much for listening. What do you think of, uh, of this audience? Good. Yes, nice people. Nice always. people, eh? Yeah. Yes, nice venue too. And did you ever had uh, such a warm welcome as you experienced uh, <laughs> just a minute ago? Yeah, a few times, but it was nice to have that again, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I understand there are some questions from the audience. Just uh, So this is the first one. Uh, what about when the robots get feelings, love, or conscience? What will happen with humanity? It has five likes, so this is a popular one. Good. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes, uh, well, let's put it this way. I mean, what robots and AI can do is that they can understand our humanity. Like, they can, they can read my face and say, oh, Gerd is tired or whatever. They can do that. And then they can say, this is what a tired human looks like. Right? And they can copy it, simulate it. But this is called the Chinese room problem. Basically, the computer has no idea how to actually understand what it feels like to be tired. Right? It has all the physical science. Face recognition does not know what a face is and what it's good for. <laughs> Information that you see on computers is basically a mathematical value. It's not an emotion. It's not consciousness. It's not agency. How we do that as humans 
We don't really know that. Right? How, how are people emotionally intelligent? Right? Allegedly, women are mostly emotionally intelligent. Right? How does that work? Why would you want a computer to be emotionally intelligent? And what a computer would do, it would run, you know, 100 trillion hours of video and it would say, these women are really emotionally intelligent. I'm going to be like this. Right? Copy it. Simulate it. But that doesn't mean that they're existing. I mean, they're simulating a response. Right? So basically, you may have seen the, uh, the robot Sophia, which was a big hit last year from Hanson Robotics in Hong Kong, right? And Sophia was put on the stage to have a conversation with people. And she seemed to give like real life intelligent answers, like a person. <laughs> but the bottom line is Sophia had saved a million possible replies on every possible question. It's like an archive, right? So you ask Sophia, you know, what is the purpose of life? And she has a million possible answers. And that what she does, she says, okay, what is, you know, the guy looks angry or happy or the audience is excited. I'm gonna pull out this answer, right? Like IBM Watson does. And she gives a good answer because there's a million of them, right? <laughs> But the answer in itself is absolutely useless for the, for the computer. It has no idea what it's saying. It's just pulling out a response. Right? So to understand that a computer will be like us, where we don't do this, you know, when you think of your husband or your wife, you don't, you don't pull out the JPEG like this and you say, oh, there, there she is, right? No, you don't. It's, it's a million facts. I think you once said, we're not downloaded, we're born. Yes. So, I mean, the idea of, of, of machines becoming like us, it may be possible when they get really, really, really fancy in 50 years, yeah. Oh, this is a good question. How will artificial intelligence change hospitality? That's the human experience a lot of people you see in hospitality, you know? The high-touch thing of our business. Uh, how do you see Yeah, I, th I think hospitality, especially restaurants and hotels, will be impacted by every process that is routine, that is not so important, computers can do. Mm. Right? I mean, let's put it this way. If I'm in a, in a nice hotel, I'm going to sit down for dinner, I don't want to order my wine on an iPad, you know? But I'm 56. Right? I'm not 14. A 14-year-old, if they can drink wine, <laughs> you know, whatever, the anti-alcoholic beverage list, uh, they'll be happy with an iPad or a wristwatch. Yeah? So this is the thing about us. You know, the market is becoming fragmented. And technology helps us to serve those people. Like in a hotel, we're going to be able to pick our music before we arrive. Mm -hmm. Our lights, and those are good things, right? Mm -hmm. But do I want to have to go to an iPad, you know, to talk to somebody? No. So I think that basically what's happening is the more we digitize, yeah. the more the human connection becomes valuable. Okay. But it is a bit of a premium. Mm. So, so that's something some, you have to pay for. Yeah. I think we're going to pay for human service, and we're going to pay for privacy. Also, we are already paying for privacy. Yeah? Look at Apple, right? We're paying for yeah. being private. But I think this, this is really important. It's a polarization. You know, for the stuff that, that's commodity, we pay less, and it's automated. You go to a sushi restaurant where you can talk to the iPad, and, and you don't have a waiter. The bot comes out with a sushi. A person makes a sushi, yeah. OK. Now, so we're talking about that. Will humans uh, still make food in the future? Or will be there some kind of robo chef with three Michelin stars, let's I say. think it's going to be the same thing. We have, uh, you know, fast food will be automated. Mm -hmm. Anything that is, you know, of that value chain where that's already kind of automated. You know? yeah. And then we'll have the top end where it's all about humans. And you still use machines, for example, for bookkeeping and those kind of things, you know. Yeah. So I think we're going to use machines and robots pretty much everywhere. But if we want to have a real connection, you know, I mean, remember that trust isn't digital. Uh, feelings aren't digital, the happiness is not a download. You know. I mean, for the human mind, it's all about relationships mm -hmm. and experiences. And that's what food is all about. Right? So can we commoditize relationships? Yeah, we can, and people can make money with that too. But generally speaking, I think that's what we're going to pay for, you know, the experience, the relationship. You know, no. Will that change? Yeah, probably in some way. But that's my hope that we can contain this. Right? Yeah. So the industry, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry, will still be playing a vital role in society in the upcoming 30 years. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, I think the CEO of Walmart once said, um, the more we digitize, the more we differentiate by being human. Mm. Right? Of course, that's a strange thing to say for Walmart, I guess, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So for us, it's about this process. You know, as we digitize, we have to also discover what do we want to keep. Right? Absolutely. I always say that the more we, 
connect, we more, the more we must protect as well. Right? We must actually safeguard against giving up too much. Yeah, that's an interesting right? one. Yeah. And that's what we're going to spend some serious money on that too, I think. Got a, another question from the audience, perhaps? With the school system lagging behind on current tech developments, what do you advise to make sure that they are fit for the future? So. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Ba basically, the, last, the, the next uh, five to ten years, if you're in tech and you have a tech education, that's good because we don't have enough people doing tech. You know? I mean, today, if you're a data scientist, you make more money than the CEO. You know? In 10 years, tech will program itself. We can speak to a computer and say, hey, make an app. We can do that now, it's just not really working. But in five, seven, 10 years, I mean, today, India graduates one million engineers a year. That's because machines are stupid. I got to tell the machine how to build a bridge. Mm -hmm. Can I tell a machine how to print a bridge and build it and put it up in 10 years? Probably. So in 10 years, having a tech education is not enough. Unless you're on the very, very, very top. But just a regular tech, you're going to have to have human things, right? Humanities, ethics, understanding, philosophy, negotiation. And do you learn empathy in school, or compassion, or emotional intelligence? Probably not. Uh, but I think we're going to see that on the agenda of schools. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Final going question. back to this, uh, you know, shifting away from this obsession of saying everybody should know how to program. Yeah. yeah of course, everybody should know how to program. But is that going to save us now? No. Yeah. It's nice to know, but everybody should be human. <laughs> and in that way, I think we can save our future. All right, last question, perhaps. Can you imagine that there will be a technical solution somewhere in the future that skips our biological need of food? So we don't have to drink uh, at all. <laughs> that will be a serious transition. Yeah, that's next year, you know, just not just. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think the, yes, of course, you know, technology makes all kinds of things possible. Can you envision a future in 20 years where we're going to live to be 150? Yeah, it's possible. Can you imagine a future where we're going to be superhuman and be like Tom Cruise and Minority Report? Yes, it is possible with technology. The question is, what do we want? What do we want to be? That's the key question. Of course we can do, do that, right? But I think being a human entails things that have nothing to do with technology. Yeah? And one of them is eating. Yeah? yeah, it's not efficient to eat and the whole process of eating and sleeping. Right? But you know, people have looked at this and they said, for example, kids today, don't really have to learn how to handwrite, right? There's no reason to learn how to handwrite because in a very short time, the computer will do all these things for you just by thinking or by speaking. Right? But every person that knows anything about the brain would say, if you don't learn how to handwrite, you are in deep trouble <laughs> because your brain just doesn't develop, right? Yeah. So I think for us to be human is the primary objective. And Food is really part of that, so I can't envision that to be, you know, may maybe Elon Musk will say, you know, we're going to feed it to the holes that he drills, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but we'll see. We'll wait for his announcement. Well, thank you very much, Gerd. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Gerd Lander. Thank you. Well done.